Today's decision to cancel the Energy East pipeline is a direct result of two years of political interference by the Liberal Party. Yes. Failure is the only word that comes to mind. TransCanada dealt a blow today to the Trudeau government and its promise to get oil to Tidewater by pipeline. The opposition, as you just heard, naturally pounced. And at issue is here to talk about it all. Andrew is in Toronto tonight, Althea in Washington, D.C. And in for Chantal this week, Paul Wells, who's in Ottawa. Welcome to all three of you. Good to see you again. Nice to see the you. Liberal position on this was clear. Uh, TransCanada, according to Jim Carr, a business decision this was, and it had nothing to do with any change to the regulatory environment. But I'm wondering, Andrew, first, uh, whether you think, in fact, the changed landscape actually had a role, or to what extent it had a role in this. Well, it's interesting the lineup of people who do think it. You have a strange concurrence between the environmental groups, Sierra Club, Environmental Defense, et cetera, uh, who think that it did play a role, that in fact this, you know, this new environmental process would, had doomed the pipeline, and the oil industry and the conservatives, on the other hand, who are also saying the same thing. Uh, I actually think if you look at the numbers on this in terms of declining oil prices, declining oil production, and the expected, and I emphasize expected, coming on stream of the Keystone XL and the Trans Mountain pipelines, that there would be a good business case for shutting this, this pipeline project. Um, but, it, you know, the process that has, has evolved in Canada surely can't be helping, let's put it that way. But, uh, Which was very much what we heard from economists today, Paul, yeah. that this was an inadvisable change in regulation, but not likely to be the dominant factor in the decision. What's your take, Paul? Well, I listened to the proponent, TransCanada, who are not mute in this process. They wrote to the National Energy Board, and they, and they, uh, they said that um, they didn't say, well, the price of uh, oil has gotten too far down, or Stephen Harper destroyed social license. What they actually said was, uh, the cost of the regulatory process is daunting and we don't want to play anymore. Uh, and Rachel Notley, whose political survival depends on getting some of these pipelines built uh, or getting Alberta's economy to rebound one way or the other, but these pipelines could sure help, also said that she looks forward to the NEB uh, uh, demonstrating a little bit more clarity in the future than they mm -hmm. have in the past. To me, that sounds like the, uh, the process is part of the problem. So look to the political consequences of this then, and I'll see I'll begin with you because, yes, Rachel Notley expressing extreme disappointment, but the strongest reaction we had was from outgoing Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall and his statement absolutely savaging the government, saying it's not a good day for Canada, not a good day for the Federation, but a very bad day for the West. And here's some of his Facebook statement actually questioning the West's place in the Federation, that this may well have some Westerners wondering if this country really values Western Canada, its resources, the things the West does to contribute to the national economy and to the quality of life for all Canadians. Althea, what clash has this set up? I think conservative politicians, and I use conservative, uh, not just big C conservative here, but I include uh, Brad Wall in that. I include um, other conservatives that are not necessarily least the rate and like sort of party in Ottawa. But I think that there is a deep desire by some people to basically paint the Trudeau government uh, with the same brush that was uh, the same attacks that were levied on his father with the National Energy Program. There is a desire to make this a clash between the West and the rest and the Liberals are out of touch with Western Canadians. And you know we also heard from Brian Gallant from New Brunswick who was also deeply disappointed that this project did not see uh, the light of day. So. I think that there is a political, there are political points to be scored on this mm -hmm. issue uh, by painting this issue as being anti-West, but I don't think this decision was made, and this decision, I'm talking here about the Liberal government coming out in January with a new uh, environmental policy saying that upstream and downstream greenhouse gas emissions were going to be included uh, in any new energy programs, right. uh, and in any proposed energy pipelines uh, like the Energy East project. So, um, well, let me bring Andrew in on this because do you think there was a political calculus here for the Liberal government in lining up with Quebec on this one, Andrew? Well, they, they, there's a larger political calculus, which is they're trying to put themselves in the center between the no pipelines anywhere and the no carbon tax anywhere people and saying we can find a balance where we both have a carbon tax and we bring in pipelines. And they're finding it harder and harder to maintain that middle ground. Uh, and they're under a lot of pressure on this. I will say yeah. the actions of Daniel Kader, the Montreal, mayor of Montreal, were very unhelpful in this regard of basically doing a kind of an end zone dance 
around this decision. Um, there are emotions are extremely raw in Alberta right now and in Western Canada generally, and this is not helpful at all. This, there, there are real national unity implications around this. I was wondering what you thought, Paul, on this point, whether we were going to see it. Althea was hearkening back to the national energy policy days, whether there will be, you know, hypothetically another round of bumper stickers, let the blanks freeze in the dark again, if the sentiment is that strong. Yeah, there's the, the, the regional politics are obvious, and all of the usual suspects were only too gleeful to, uh, to, to entertain those regional politics today. I'll note that Denis Coderre is in a fight for his life running for re-election this fall, and he richly deserves to be because he tends to act on file after file the way he acted this morning. <laughs> but you don't have to play regional politics. Look, Justin Trudeau got elected on a promise to do essentially something magical. He would be far more effective on the environment and on climate change than Stephen Harper, and that would somehow allow him to be more effective on promoting the oil sands. Uh, and it's turning out to be about as hard as that sounds. It certainly puts we... more pressure and more emphasis on the, getting the Trans Mountain Pipeline built. I mean, if you thought the, the heat was on on that one uh, uh, before all this, that's absolutely now crucial, crucial for Alberta and, and crucial for the country. And Alcia, you wanted in on this? Well, I just think we can't be naive. Like the provincial premier is acting their own self-interest and that what we're seeing in response to today's decision is just that. Uh, with regards to uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline, Andrew is absolutely right and it's actually in federal court this week, mm -hmm. federal court of appeal this week, which I think is another thing that uh, perhaps uh, TransCanada was thinking about because even when you get a pipeline approved, maybe that's not the end of the road. Maybe there are indigenous groups like there are with Energy East who are adamantly opposed who will actually get to revisit this issue after. So many hurdles beyond. What about not just regional but also at the federal level? I mean we heard Lisa Raitt very strongly calling that uh, everything that Justin Trudeau touches a nightmare, a disaster, saying that this is so bad for investment and specifically for middle class jobs. Paul, is this a winning strategy for the Conservatives now? Uh, the oppositions are going to oppose. The Liberals would have said the same thing uh, if they were still in opposition. I'll note that it was uh, Joe Oliver, the uh, Conservative Natural Resource Minister, who wrote at the beginning of 2012 that building these pipelines was an urgent matter in Canada's national interest. And by the time he was voted out of office in 2015, he'd gotten nowhere either. These are hard things to do. It's just that Justin Trudeau doesn't turn out to have a magic formula that's a lot better than what the Conservatives were doing. So we're seeing in the polls, we'll see whether there's a turning away from Justin Trudeau and the Liberals as a result of this issue. We are seeing of late uh, a softening in the polls in terms of Liberal support. And there is a new political factor on the landscape now, and that is the new NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh. Althea, let me talk uh, to you first about him, because much was made about the fact that he won on the first ballot, that only Tommy Douglas and Jack Layton had had more than 50% right out of the gate in the first round. What does that tell you about where the party is, what, what the members are feeling, uh, where it sees itself after the 2015 loss? Well, first of all, it says that Jagmeet Singh is a very good organizer uh, and that he knows how to count and he knows how to get his vote out. Um, I think what we've seen basically since the 2004-2003 leadership race that elected Jack Layton and then elected um, Thomas Mulcair in 2012 and now Jagmeet Singh last on Sunday is that you Democrats want to win. They want to achieve power. They no longer want to be the conscience of parliament and just talking about things to possibly influence the liberals. They want to run the government, and that's why they picked Jagmeet Singh, because they think he has the best shot uh, to basically dethrone Justin Trudeau. Gadfly no more, Andrew, or how do you see this? Well, they also saw in the course of that race that they didn't want to go down that center ground route that they had gone under Tom Mulcair. I mean, I think a lot of New Democrats thought, you know, we sold our soul, and what did we get? You know, we got a lousy uh, election performance, or at least compared to what their expectations were. And so, so partly I agree that he has, uh, he has a certain electoral appeal and also it, it's he, the New Democrats want to feel good about themselves. They want to feel like they are uh, the crusading party of old and he helps them in that regard. I see. I'm not convinced of that because I think that he, while he campaigned on the left because uh, very left, like he seems like a complete pacifist when it comes to using the military and he suggested that he wants free tuition and all these wonderful things that New Democrats love. I'm not convinced that when it comes to the election in 2019, those things will find their way in an NDP platform. That's fair enough. So uh, certainly people are casting him now as, you know, obviously, similarities between his rival Justin Trudeau. He invites those sorts of comparisons. Paul, what kind of challenges does Jagmeet Singh present for the prime minister? 
Uh, I think he really complicates Justin Trudeau's game. Justin Trudeau ran in 2015 as, as uh, uh, an avatar of youth and change and embrace of diversity uh, uh, and a new generation. And he's outbid on all of those offers by Jagmeet Singh. That doesn't mean that um, Singh is guaranteed power. Look, when, when everybody in Canada who thinks of themselves as a liberal votes liberal, the liberals tend to win majority governments. When everyone in Canada who thinks of themselves as a new Democrat votes new Democrat, the new Democrats tend to win about 40 seats. Uh, Singh has to reach far outside uh, his, his natural party base to become the first new Democratic uh, prime minister in history. And typically when you reach outside your base, one of the things you risk doing is alienate, alienating mm -hmm. your base. He risks being more of a spoiler than of a natural. Both but, Andrew and Alcia are nodding. Andrew, to you, he, and then Alcia, you can wrap it up on that. Yes. He can certainly be a spoiler. I mean, liberal strategy going back eons is you, you, you nail down the New Democrat vote, you hammer the New Democrats into the ground, and you suck up all that vote. Uh, and that is very much what this government has been doing over the last couple of years. I think they, in other words, they bet pretty heavily on that. I think this really complicates that. They've, they've lost touch with a lot of center right voters that were part of the Liberal coalition under Kretchen and Martin. I think this really complicates their electoral calculation. Alcia, the fact that he is, as much has been made, uh, the first ethnic minority to be a leader of a major party in Canada, how much does that play in his favor? How much of a challenge is that? I don't think it's going to be that much of a challenge. I think that uh, perhaps voting for Jagmeet Singh will make people feel good about themselves, much like people voted for Barack Obama because they wanted to see change happen. Um, I, a lot of that will depend on what he's actually proposing. Uh, you know, nobody was happier f to see Jagmeet Singh be uh, chosen the NDP leader on Sunday than every conservative in this country who thinks that uh, he will prevent the Liberals from having another majority government. Uh, not sitting in the House, I don't think is going to be a problem. Um, Justin Trudeau showed that not showing up to a uh, question period when he was a third-party leader uh, was not a problem connecting with everyday Canadians. Plus, he doesn't have uh, that compare and contrast if, when, if he does get elected in 2019, no matter which side of the aisle he is. Mm -hmm. He won't be compared to Thomas Mulcair. He won't be compared to people like that. He will be able to define his own role. Have to leave it at that, but I appreciate all of your thoughts. As always, um, a pleasure to have you in. Andrew and Althea and Paul Wells tonight are at issue panel, and thanks to all three.